All right, good morning and welcome to Grace Bible. I'd like to invite you guys to stand and sing with us as we begin the morning in worship. faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with a sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. your people remember your children remember your promise oh God your grace is enough your grace is enough your grace is enough Remember? So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Oh, your grace is enough. Oh, your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Thin, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. 
Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a sin. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness. Was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I believe that you're my healer. I believe that you are all I need. And I believe that you're my portion. I believe you're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. You are 
walk with me through fire and heal all my disease and I will trust in you and I will trust in you I believe that you're Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You hold the world in your hands. Nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. You hold the world in your hands. I believe that you're my I believe. I believe that you're my healer. I believe that you are all I need. I believe that you're my portion. I believe. You're more than enough for me. Jesus, you're all I need. Lord, it says in your word uh, that your power is made perfect in our weakness, uh, that your grace is sufficient as we sang, your grace is enough. Uh, Lord, it also says in your word that we can cast all of our cares on you because you care for us. Um, It says we love because you first loved us. It says also, as we talked about last week, that, uh, that we now have access to the throne of grace, that we can run boldly um, to you for help. I'm remembering in a Tim Keller sermon uh, that he said the the only person who would dare wake a king in the middle of a night for a glass of water is his son or his daughter. And that's what we are to you, that we can run to you at any time in our time of need, and you meet us with grace and help and mercy in that time of need. So, Lord, uh, I pray that this morning that you would fill us with an overwhelming sense of your, your fatherly love for us, um, that there would be no fear um, or shame or feeling that we need to hide, but Lord, that there would just be an outpouring of a sense of your love and your welcome, that you welcome us with open arms this morning, and that we can bring to you um, anything that we're wrestling with, anything that ails us, Lord. Uh, So open our eyes this morning to your love, uh, to your wonder, to your glory. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have a seat.
Good morning. Today we have communion. Looking forward to, to celebrating with you. What a wonderful song we just heard. That He is our provision. He's our protection. He's our strength. He's our healer. You know, this month's scripture that the, the elders are looking to in, in Ephesians 3 speaks about that as well. You know, we live in a can-do society where if we can uh, conceive it and believe it, we can achieve it. Not really. Our ability only comes through Christ, through what He's done. And this morning, as we consider communion, as we move into the, the teaching part of our service, we know He's able to take His Word and bring it to life for us. Let's go before Him in prayer right now. Precious Heavenly Father, we come before You this morning recognizing that there's absolutely nothing that we can do on our own. Oh, You've given us physical strength and You've given us minds and wisdom. You've given us opportunity. But Lord, the power that we get to do that only comes through your Son. Only comes through the work that was done on the cross for us. Sin in you. Our believing in you. You are the one that's able. And Father, we want to recognize our inability to do anything for ourselves. We can't earn our salvation. We can't look good in your eyes except through what your Son's done. And we think of all the things that you are able to do, Lord. You're able to protect. You're able to encourage. You accept us the way we are. You, you give us grace. You protect us in those times of doubt. You deliver us from temptation. Lord, we just want to live lives that are dependent on you, to your honor and your glory and your praise. Lift up this time of teaching, our pastor, that you would have your, your hand of protection on him, that you would fill him with your spirit, use him, that we'd sense your presence here today. And Lord, that we would truly bring a smile to your face. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we're going to talk about radical faith, and so I spent some time throughout the week looking up stories of radical faith. And the more I read and the more illustrations that I found, the more I realized that none of them really applied to what I was trying to say. Because what I'm really trying to say is that our radical faith doesn't always issue in the next big thing. We don't always step out and start an international ministry that reaches thousands of people. We don't always change abruptly a career course from one direction to another based on some catastrophic event in our life. And so to use that as illustrations are, is to set us up for failure, to think that every time I exercise faith, it must be something big. When the truth is, is the vast majority of our lives are lived in the mundane, lived in the day-to-day, -day, lived in the hustle and bustle of life here in this sinful world, raising a family, going to work, going to school, but I would contend that it's in those areas that the Lord is calling us to exercise the most radical of faiths. Not just an event, not just something that we drum ourselves up to and then we do something grand. It's in the day-to-day, moment-to-moment -moment times. Maybe there's a time that God has called you to do something radical and trusting him in your day-to-day -day life. Maybe it's happening right now. Struggling with a family member who's wayward or, or sick, it seems impossible to turn them over to the loving hands of God for fear of what might happen. 
Maybe you're struggling with the recurring sin, a habit that you just can't, just can't lick. And it seems just like giving up. And trusting for Jesus, the outcome of this seems so terrifying that you just remain stuck. This is as good as it gets, we tell ourselves. Perhaps your marriage is in a tough spot, which happens and has been for some time. Maybe you don't know what else to do. In these all too common situations, Jesus is calling us to radically trust him come what may, to relinquish the outcome and to simply look upon him in faith because the truth is, is that Jesus uses our radical faith in him to do radical things. He does radical things. Our job to believe, his job to create outcomes. This is important for us. We got to get this. This is something that we all struggle with all of our lives and to ignore it or to not be cognizant of, its, of it being there is dangerous. Why? Because instead of trusting the Lord for an outcome, what we end up doing is trusting in ourselves for it. We take control for things that were never intended to be controlled and so we manipulate and finagle things. We wrestle things out of our lives in order to get what we believe we need. Or we trust in our own strength our own talents, our own charisma. We were reading a book with the elders um, uh, by Crawford Loritz who talked about perhaps the most dangerous thing for Christian leaders to do is to trust in their talent. We manipulate. We seek to work harder to find approval before God and before others. A God who already approves us in Christ and others who don't really matter. Or we look to our guilt and our shame and we're motivated by it instead of trusting in the Lord, in his word that we have been forgiven once and for all because of what he has done on the cross, not how we feel about our sin or even about ourselves. You see, we limit our resources when we look to ourselves alone. Phil had it spot on. If you can conceive it and you can dream it, you believe it, you can do it. There are some things that are too big for us. Most things are too big for us. Looking to God opens the floodgates of his power to accomplish his will in our lives for his glory. And guess what? We just get the good. It's sort of a secondary, a secondary effect to it. So today, we're going to go through Mark 5. Now, many of you remember, it hadn't been that long since we did a series on Mark. And so this is a message that we have talked about in the past, but the Lord has really prompted me to talk about it again. So we're going to talk about the woman who had the discharge of blood in Mark 5, verses 24 through 34. The more I read this and studied this week, and the more I've been thinking about this in general, it's, this is quickly becoming perhaps my favorite account in the scripture. There's so much here that teaches us about life and how to live and how to trust in what Jesus is capable of when we come to him in radical faith. So the story actually starts in verse 21. If you have your Bibles, great, open them. If you don't, we're going to have it up here on the screen. The story, the account starts in verse 21, where Jesus crosses the lake and is approached by a ruler of the synagogue named Jairus. Jairus' daughter is dying, and he beckons Jesus, please come heal her immediately. So Jesus goes on the way. The problem is, is that Jesus doesn't go anywhere fast. He's like in Eisenhower traffic all the time. Because he is doing things, miraculous moves, changing lives, feeding thousands, people are looking to him for everything, whether or not it's in true faith or they just want a spectacle. So everywhere he goes, he's surrounded by people. So imagine Jairus, Lord, come save my child. She's at the point of death. Jesus says, I will go with you and is immediately surrounded by hundreds or thousands even of people. And this is where we are. In verse 24, and he went with him and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, but was no better, but rather grew worse. The text says that this woman has um, some sort of gynecological problem she has sought help. I mean, we look at doctors today and there's so much that doctors cannot do still 
today. Now go back 2,000 years and imagine what even less they were capable of doing then. Yet this woman spends everything she has. She goes again and again to doctors in order to find some healing, some respite from her suffering. And Jesus, there he is, surrounded by a throng to come and see the spectacle that is the healer, the prophet, even the revolutionary from God, the one who would save us, the Israelites from Rome and the foreign oppressor. The crowd's crushing in on him. And here's this woman who's been sick every day for the last 12 years with something so personal, so hidden, so secret that she can't tell anybody. The scripture talks about people who are in this very situation and why this is so dire in the book of Leviticus. In chapter 15 of the book of Leviticus, in verse 25, it says, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, this sounds like this woman, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, sounds like this woman, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge shall continue, she shall continue in uncleanness. What does that mean? As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, shall be to her as the bed of her impurity. And everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanness of her menstrual impurity. And whoever touches these things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and shall be unclean until morning. During this time, when a woman was during her monthly cycle, she would separate from the rest of the family. If she were married and have children, there would be a separate space for her. There'd be a separate chair for her. There'd be a separate bed for her. Prior to this, in ancient Israel, even before this, when a woman was in her menstrual impurity, there'd be a separate tent for her. God made it clear that there was something in blood that causes us to separate. God made it clear when he gave his Ten Commandments to the Jews that there was the idea of separation, of clean and unclean, of pure and impure. This is one of those areas that God says we needed to be careful of, that the Jews needed to be careful of. And so here's this woman in a dire situation. We read it and we just say, oh man, she just had menorrhagia. It's a fancy word. Am I right? Boom. Doctor said yes. And as awful as it sounds even today, her situation is dire then. Dire, consider it. The horrific implication of this woman's condition cannot be overstated. Financially, she's ruined. She has spent everything she had on doctors. And she's only getting worse. Now, this woman, whether or not she's married, we don't know. But the plight of a single woman during this time was dire in a patristic society. She had probably no source of income. And if she did, it was her dowry that was supposed to have been used for her to get married. Jesus calls her daughter. We don't know how old she is. We don't know if she's older than him, younger than him, but it's very possible that she was unmarried and that money that was intended to be for her wedding was now being used to treat this thing she had never expected she would have to deal with. There were religious implications. She was unclean, and because of that, she couldn't go to the temple. The central place, imagine not being able to come to church, nor to growth groups, nor to any gathering of any of your brothers and sisters. She couldn't go to synagogue. She couldn't walk the walk, ascending the steps to the temple. She couldn't participate in Passover, the Day of Atonement, or any of the other festivals that marked time for the Jewish people. No Christmas, no Easter. Socially, she was an outcast. Unclean people at this time were, (laughs) there was no one lower than an unclean person, particularly a woman who was unclean. If she were married, she wouldn't have been able to sleep in the same bed as her husband 12 years. The psychological impact The isolation that all this would cause, the shame and grief. Can you imagine? Why me? What did I do? I must have done something wrong. Why is it that I'm struggling? Why is it that I'm suffering? 
walking around the whole time throughout Jerusalem knowing. This is what's happening. They don't know, but I know. She might as well be wearing a sign. Now, we don't know what was wrong with her in the physical realm. I mean, this is bad enough, but she, this woman could have had cancer. This woman could have had fibroids or a bleeding disorder, hormonal problems. There could have been a whole myriad of other issues that went along with this. But imagine the spiritual implications, the wrestling of the one who had to deal with a situation like this. I just think about if this were me wrestling with God. Lord, you said you would take this. You said you can do anything. I read in your word, Lord, that you can heal the sick. I know that you can do this, Lord, but you won't do it for me. Why? Is it because you're not good? Is it because I'm not deserving? Is it because you don't love me? Imagine what she would be saying. Needless to say, this poor woman is in a place, if we really understood, and I've tried to paint a picture for you here, is dire. Is dire. There's no other word for it. She had made myriad attempts to address the issues by human resources, everything she had, but she'd extinguished them all. She was at the end of herself. But because God is good, this is not the end of the story. Verse 27, she heard a report about Jesus. There was a testimony out there of what Christ was doing in the very present for her. She heard and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment, for she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. She heard a report, a testimony. This woman believed based on the word of a messenger of what Jesus was doing, that if he could do it for them, perhaps he could do it for her. She had nothing to lose. She was at the end of herself and her faith is expressed in such a way she says that even if I can just touch his coat, the word here in Greek talks about his outer garment. If I could just touch the clothing that he's wearing, he can change me. He can heal me. And so she did. She presses through the thronging crowd. She reaches out and touches Christ's Robe, and immediately it says in verse 29, the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. A couple comments. In the beginning, when we first start reading, the first uh, verse it says, and there was a woman who had a discharge, a flow is the word in Greek, a flow of blood. In this verse, it says, immediately the flow of blood dried up, but the word here is actually fount, fountain source. She was healed at the source. This wasn't just taking Tylenol for a headache. This was removing the issue. We so often try to treat symptoms. Jesus wants to treat causes. We try to take pills. We try to do things. We try to think differently. We try to cover over the feelings so that we can feel better and deal with life on life's terms. But that's not how Jesus works with us. Jesus wants to heal us at the core, at the cause of the problem. It's often painful. But we have to let him. Not only that, in the end of this verse 29, it says, and healed of her disease. There's a typical word in Greek for disease. This word is the same word that's used for whip. So it's used metaphorically to mean torment, torture. She's healed of her torment. Wow. Wow, the power of Jesus, the power of our faith in the object, the one who can change, the one who can heal. Looking to him saying, even if I can get close, he will change me. What are you reaching for? Are you reaching for the garment of Christ? Are you reaching for a bottle or a website? or a store, or a degree. What is it that you're reaching for? Could you imagine this woman? She's lost everything. She has nothing left to lose. She 
pushes through the crowd to touch the one that she heard the report of and is immediately healed. What would that moment feel like? What would that moment feel like for you? What would it feel like for you if Jesus removed something at its source out of your heart and your life? He can do it. He can do it. Verse 30, And Jesus, perceiving in himself the power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? Now, We see again and again that Jesus knows everything. We know that Jesus knows what's in a man. We know that Jesus can say the future. We know that Jesus is capable of knowing who it was in a crowd of people who touched him. So why did he ask? Well, I think there's a couple of thoughts here. One is Jesus is calling forth a confession of faith from this woman. What she was seeking to do in secret, he was calling her out in public to do. You see, when we're called, when we're healed, when we're saved, we're called to give a confession of our faith out loud. We're called to give a confession, a story, a testimony, to give a report of what Jesus has done in our lives to heal us. But I think it's also that Christ is calling this woman to tell her story. There's something powerful about coming out of the dark, about no longer being in secret, about sharing with others what actually has happened in your life. The cleansing that would come with no longer holding on to secrets. Because as it's been said, secrets keep us sick. Verse 31, and his disciples said to him, typically, always in the earthly realm. You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Can you see her? She fell on the ground and just rattling off as quickly as she can, hoping that this leader is not like the other leaders. Hoping that this man who healed her is not like the Pharisees who walk around with pomp and hypocrisy. Ones who would be aghast at the idea of touching one who is unclean. Would he just be another one? Would I just be rejected again? We see Christ say no. She falls at his feet and confesses the whole truth. I mean, think about what she had to overcome. What would the crowd think? knowing that she had the presumption to push her way through in a place of impurity, in a state of uncleanness, to reach Jesus. What are you willing to do to touch Jesus? Jesus tells her and invites her to tell her story with a simple question, who touched me? Have you touched Jesus? Maybe you're sitting here today, you like the idea, you know that there's something going on, but you've not reached out to touch him. You've not reached out to touch him and then to tell your story about what he's done. Verse 34, she doesn't find a Pharisee. She finds a brother, a father, a savior. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. If I went literally in Greek, it would say, he said to her, daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed of your torment. Changes the flavor of it a little bit, doesn't it? Doesn't it? You see, even in our sickness, in our infirmity, we, we talk about salvation as this idea of, and rightly so, but we limit it to the realm of, I have sins, I have to pay the penalty of those sins, that penalty is death, but Christ doesn't want that, so he died for me that I might go to heaven. Sort of like fire insurance. Get out of hell. We talk about it like that. And that's definitely a part of it. But when we read the scripture and we look at it in its fullest sort of picture, salvation is much more than that. Salvation is not only salvation eternally, but it's deliverance from the things that continue to torment us. It's change. It's becoming Christ-likeness. It's receiving the inheritance that comes from the Holy Spirit. It means being transformed and brought into a new realm. So she finds no condemnation from this man, this teacher, this prophet, this healer, her God. She found only affirmation, 
healing, and peace as part of God's family. If you ask me, this is a story of radical faith. We might not look at this story in those terms, but I think about everything she had to overcome. The inertia of being stuck where she was saying, this is my life, this is as good as it gets, nothing's going to change. The amount of energy it took to overcome that could only be done in the power of faith. So this is a story that I think all of us can relate to. We might not have anything that lines up in terms of the story, in terms of bleeding and a crowd and Jesus and all that, but I can tell you this, we're all walking around with something that no one knows about that's been stuck there for a long time and we really want it to go and we know that God really wants it to go. And I can say that categorically true about everybody because of the nature of our sin, the nature of this world and the nature of our progressive sanctification becoming more like Christ. So how do we develop a radical faith like this woman had? There's five ways. First, remember that radical faith goes beyond the head and to the heart. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Okay, so we look at these words and we see an emotional aspect. There's a conviction here, Okay. Faith is not simply pretending. This is all what's really going on, but I'm going to ignore it. As long as I don't think about it, everything will be okay. We live in that realm far too often. Instead of recognizing a trauma, a pain, a sin, an issue, we just say it doesn't exist. Meanwhile, it affects every aspect and relationship in our lives. Faith is not an emotional stirring up, a fomenting of something. It's not wishful thinking. And it's not objectless. What does that mean? That means true faith always has an object to which it is pointed. This is a tricky thing. We're going to talk about it because very often the object of our faith is not Jesus. The object of our faith is something other. So let's talk about what faith is. Faith is a multidimensional experience, expression rather, of worship and submission. It's your God, I'm not. Biblical faith orients the creature-creator relationship. It says that, I am yours. You created me. Biblical faith is more than a cognitive function, but encompasses every aspect of the soul. Reformers talked about three levels of faith. The first is that I know this to be true. Yeah, I agree. The Bible is real. Yes, the Bible is true. Demons have that kind of faith. Demons believe that the Bible is true. The next level of faith is not only do I know it's true or I know the facts, but I know it's true and I believe it will happen or I believe it's... Demons have that level of faith. I fear that many of us walk around most of the time with that level of faith, the faith of demons. They know God exists. They know God is real. They know God is powerful. They know that he's going to judge one day. Yet we stop. And don't push into the realm of where true biblical faith exists, the place where Christ calls us. That's trust. True biblical faith is not just a cognitive understanding of biblical principles, but it's an emotional response. It's, I trust you. I don't like flying. I went to Bolivia. It's a long flight. Not only that, there's two flights and then two flights back. Every time I get on a plane, some of you know I have dreams at night about falling. I have for years now. So getting on a plane is not a joyous experience for me, okay? Every time I'm on the tarmac and I'm sitting there looking out at the people getting on the plane, I'm looking out at the wing, checking every little rivet to make sure it looks like it's in the wing and everything, I have to say this prayer. Lord, if it's your will that I die today, I'm okay with that. I have to. I have to. Because ultimately, when I get in that plane, the object of my faith is every mechanic who touched it, every pilot who pilots it, every stewardess who gives the right directions, pulls the right levers, does it, all of the weather, all of that. But that's not good enough. It's not good enough. The object of your faith must be Christ at the end of everything. 
We look at the word faith in the scripture and we, we sell it short. We say, I just need to have this doctrinal understanding. Sometimes we'll, we'll do things, we'll question people. And what we really want to know is to make sure if they can spout off the way we like it to be said. Well, I came to Jesus when I was 16 after realizing that I was a sinner. And then I believed and trusted that he was the only one to save me, not based on any of my works, but on the righteousness of Christ alone, which was imputed upon me, and my sin was imputed upon him on the cross. All of that's true. But that, knowing that, saying that, is not biblical faith. It's trusting that. Trust. The word faith in the Bible has belief in the principles of God. We need to understand something. We need to assent to something. But it also means, and is translated, trust in the person of God. It means dependence on the provision of God. And it means reliance on the power of God. It means that here I am. Everything is about you. I will give you everything. This is to what Jesus is calling us. Not just a portion of our life, everything. Two, ruthlessly root out other objects of faith in your life. Consider the object of your faith. The secret to a great faith is the quality of the object of your faith. That's why when we follow the Lord, it's so imperative that we look to him and learn about who he is. Because as we understand the character of Christ more and more each day, our faith will grow as a result. When we realize that nothing prevents God's hand from acting, nothing prevents Jesus from loving us, and nothing ever can, our faith in him grows. As our object grows, as what we look to grows, so does our faith. Who or what are you looking at in faith apart from Christ? Really consider the question. Walking this road of self-exploration is a never-ending process. It will occur for as long as we walk here on earth because there's always another idol. An idol is anything that we worship apart from God. John Calvin, the reformer, said that our hearts are like little idol factories, that we just continue to create things that we want to worship and place in the place of Jesus on the throne of our heart. As soon as we think we've knocked one down, it's like whack-a-mole game. Another one pops back up. This is an essential component of what it means to walk the Christian walk, to constantly be asking yourself, what am I trusting in? Who am I trusting in? I feel fear right now about this situation. Why? Because I'm placing my faith in something else. I'm angry He embarrassed me. Why? I'm placing my faith and trust in something else and any myriad of expressions in your own life. Three, come to terms with the potential loss associated with radical faith. One of the things that hinders us from walking in radical faith and living in radical faith are the implications of what might happen. Jesus did not minimize the risk or dangers of walking with him. He was clear about the cost. In fact, he called people to count the cost of following him. I think of the rich young ruler who came. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, you know, what have you done so far? He says, I've done everything. All the Ten Commandments checked off. He says, one thing you lack, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor and come follow me says he went away sad because he had many possessions. He was placing his trust in something other than Christ. He didn't want the risk, the loss associated with following Jesus. But we need to come to terms with this. When we live in radical faith, when we are living the faith that Christ is calling us to live, there will undoubtedly be people, places, and things that will need to be foregone. Things that will need to be set aside because they hold us back. They keep us from what God has promised us, that wants to give us because we're trusting in them and what they provide instead of what Jesus provides. Allow nothing or no one to eclipse Jesus as the object of your faith. You know, frankly, there are worse things in life than rejection, pain, fear, and yes, even death. 
It's far worse not to live the life of salvation that Christ earned for you on the cross. To not embrace every moment to glorify him through your life. To waste every moment that God has promised you here in this moment, celebrating what Christ has done and interacting with Jesus as your Savior who lives in your heart by faith. That's a waste. Four. Surround yourself with community who demonstrates radical faith. Jesus taught that radical faith is more caught than taught. He didn't just tell his disciples how to have faith. He showed them what it looks like. Every time they exhibited faith, he did something miraculous. They watched again and again the results of radical faith and what it can bring to the life of a person. He lived a faithful life completely on display, even when he was hidden. Namely, I'm going to pray. Come back a day later. I'm done praying. (laughs) Just that is a demonstration of a faith-filled life. He demonstrated the power of God in whom we are called to believe. We do well to surround ourselves with people who model radical faith, other pilgrims who encourage us along the way, people who will incite us to do radical things, audacious things for God, Like, simply believe them. Yet sometimes we can have our our feet in each world, this world and the heavenly one. Now, we're not called to be completely removed. We're not called to live on a commune as much as, that sounds awesome to me, by the way. I would love to be with all of you on a commune somewhere. Seriously. Randy, you're working the barn. I can see it. You know, Mary's cooking in the kitchen, making some excellent uh, Colombian food. I would love it. I would love it. You're my family. But God has given us a job. And that job is not just to love each other. We do that pretty well here at GBC. Our job is to love them out there. Our job is to be out there, focusing out there, proclaiming the name and fame. Remember, she heard a report of the one who was healed. What if no one had ever said anything to her? She would have been stuck forever, maybe. We're called to proclaim, and we do that in community with one another. The faithful can show us how they trusted, tell us stories about times that God did something amazing in their lives. But if we isolate ourselves and only come to church on Sunday, and as soon as I say the final benediction, shot out the door to your car, never to be seen again for six and a half days, then don't be surprised when your faith is not being fomented. We need each other. I need you. And you need me. It was built this way. So let's encourage, let's spur each other on to faith and good deeds. The book of Hebrews says, let's, the word is irritate one another onto faith and good deeds. We need it because we're always going to seek the easier, softer way. Participate in one of our growth groups, other ministries. Women's Bible study, band of brothers, any of the growth groups, volunteer for one of the ministries, get to know the people here. Take the first step of cultivating a deeper relationship with the believers who are here in your life out of God's goodness and grace. Finally, number five. Don't wait for your feelings to match your conviction before acting in real faith. We tend to live by feeling, okay? Because we can't see clearly. Let's, I mean, think about it. We're, in some sense, we are blinded to the reality of the world we live in, even after our salvation, we, the blinders are sort of able to be removed, but at the end of the day, we still need God's word to continue to wash us in order to see reality as it is. So a lot of the time, we're walking around life like this. And to a certain extent, it will be like that until the Lord calls us home. So we grope and we feel. This, in and of itself, is not bad. To, be, to feel and to be led by feelings. Nothing wrong with feelings. But when we make decisions that hinder us from walking in obedience to the Lord because of those feelings, it becomes a problem. When we know we should ask forgiveness, and we don't because we don't want to feel vulnerable. When we know we should extend forgiveness, but we don't because we want to hold it over people. When we know the Lord is asking us to say something to someone, but we don't because we're afraid. There's nothing wrong with those feelings in and of themselves. We need to work through them and not be motivated by them. 
So where is God calling you to act in faith-filled obedience where you're not feeling it? (laughs) Because that's likely the place that Jesus is waiting to do something miraculous in your life. Miraculous. God is calling you to make a decision this morning. I don't know what that is. You know what that is because God has been telling you about it for some time. You've been hearing the voice of God in your life, of Christ speaking to you, saying, you know, you should do this. God's calling you maybe to close a door. One that you don't want to close for fear of what it might mean. God might be calling you to act in a new opportunity to trust him for something. This is your day. This is your moment. We're going to take communion in a minute. We're going to have some quiet time before we go. There'll be music, no singing. Where you're going to be able to interact with the Lord, not only talking about the things that you've not repented of, the sins that continue to easily beset you, but also to listen to the voice of the Lord. And what is it that he is telling you? What is he calling you to do? So what are you waiting for? This is your moment. God is calling you to something better. All you have to do is step out and trust him. God is calling you to your destiny in him. Every moment you wait is another moment of glory lost for Christ. Every heavenly blessing that he's promised us, the rewards that he says that we will receive one day, we're losing them. You feel them going? Step out in what Christ has called you to do. And don't miss out on the joy of walking in God's will for your life, no matter what that looks like. A life intended to be lived by radical faith. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your truth. We pray that you would just give us a deep sense of your presence. But ultimately, Lord, get us to act. We pray, Lord, that you would do a work in us to move us into a place where we're willing to step out and trust you. Lord, open our eyes to the things that are going on in our heart, those obstacles that we place. Help us, Lord, to step out in trust. Help us, Lord, to make that one moment of energy where we shut a door, we open a door, we do something, Lord, that's preventing us to coming to you in all of your fullness. Pray, Lord, that you would be with us during this time of communion. Let us feel your presence, Lord. We thank you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. As we discussed last week and as Michael brought up again, we only have access to this faith. We only have the ability to even trust in the Lord like this because of what he has done for us. What he did on the cross thousands of years ago on our behalf. So we're going to take communion. Who does not have a communion cup? If you don't, raise your hand. We will make sure that you get one. Communion is a celebration of what Christ has done in our place to free us from the penalty of our sin and to adopt us into the family of God. It truly is is a time for both joy and solemnity. For on the one hand, Christ has ushered a new reality into our life. He saved us from the judgment to come and lives within us through his Holy Spirit. More than that, he promises us an eternal future with him and an eternity of joy and bliss. Now, on the other hand, what it took to usher in this new day is truly frightful. We need never forget, we must never forget, what it took for Christ to win this salvation for us. The crucifixion of the Lord of glory, creator of the universe, the one who has life in himself, willingly gave that life that we might live. So this is a time to reflect on our lives and talk to the Lord about that. Ask yourself, am I trusting Jesus for my salvation and for my good? Am I looking to other things? Is there a place of unforgiveness or lack of repentance in my heart? 
What I want you to do after I pray here for the elements is I want you to just sit before the Lord, talk to him, listen to him, hear him, and we'll take communion together. So hear his voice and share your heart. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christ's death on the cross on our behalf, and we thank you, Lord, for this bread and juice. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us a token to remind us because we sure do forget quick. Pray, Lord, that this would be a meaningful moment between you and, and us, that we would hear your voice, that we would be transformed and changed from one degree of glory to the next as we trust in Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord Jesus, we thank you for our life. It's because of that old rugged cross, Lord, the one you hung upon, that we can be here today, celebrate your goodness. Lord, let us never forget, and as we stand to worship and praise you, Lord, may you be on our hearts. May we be thinking of you, what you did, and what you're calling us to do in response. We thank you, Lord, for this moment. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame And I love that old cross Where the dearest and best For a world of lost sinners was slain Oh, I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it 
someday for a crown in the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty i see for it was on that cross jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down i will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross i will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever i'll share now i'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last i lay down i will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown so i'll cherish the old If you'd like, you can stand and uh, join us in these last two songs. Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise And teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mountain fixed upon it, Mount of God's redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, Hither by thy help I come. And I hope by thy good pleasure Safely to arrive at home And Jesus sought me when a stranger Wandering from the fold of God He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. O 
to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts of Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts of How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. Cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. And Jesus Christ, my its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. And out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim. It's grim. 
upon me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ, my living hope Oh, hallelujah Praise the one who set me free grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name Jesus Christ my living hope oh Jesus Christ my living hope oh God you are my living hope Amen. Christ indeed is our living hope. May you go this week in that hope, in radical faith, calling, doing what he's calling you to do, trusting in him. Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would give them strength and joy as they go this week. I pray, Lord, that you would help them close doors that need closing, open doors to opportunities that need to be opened, all while trusting in you. It's in your name I pray. Amen. God bless you.